Okay, everybody. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. And I would like to welcome you to our start of the evening track. There is probably no need to introduce our speaker, FX from Feno Elite. And he's going to talk us the next hour through the question of what to do with barcodes and what fun to have with them. Um, due to the short time constraints, uh, would you please keep your question, uh, questions to the end? We'll have microphones ready for you. And now, FX, you have it. Thank you. So, um, thank you for showing up. Um, this talk is in English. I um, quit the poll if it should be in German or English. Um, yeah. We talk about barcodes. Um, nothing more boring than that. We do a quick intro into barcodes, really quick intro. Um, we talk about encoding and decoding, scanners, um, some tricks you can play with the barcodes themselves, with the backend systems. We look at some selected samples that we decoded for you and um, some unsolved cases that we decoded, but we don't know what the shit is, is meaning. And some we close, as the good hackers we are, with some notes on principles how to use barcodes securely if you happen to be in a situation to implement them. Now, um, since the dawn of new legislation in Germany, we need disclaimers. So, dear audience, um, this talk covers observation made of widely used and well-documented systems. So, dear law enforcement, um, yeah, that's you with the internet printout. Um, you can keep your anti-hacker um, tool laws under the table because we only need brains and printers. History of barcodes. Um, really quick, because that's boring. Um, the only thing that's really interesting is it was invented in um, 48, and then the first people to really try it was the American railroad system. And um, what's in interesting about that is it took them actually um, 17 years to develop the system, then it took them another seven years to label the cards, and then they realized it didn't work. In contrast to that, um, the National Food Association, or National Association for Food Chains, rather, um, in 66 came up with the idea to save money to make the checkout in a supermarket faster. And um, the idea actually kind of worked. So in 69, um, they requested an industry standard, which later became UPC, um, the most widely used barcode on products in the world. And in 81, barcodes really took off when the US Department of Defense required code um, 38 to be labeled on everything they buy, which includes like military toilet paper and camouflage and tanks and whatnot. So let's dive into barcodes. Um, barcode people talk about symbologies. It's really funny because not even Microsoft Word knows this word and keeps saying it's spelled wrong. Um, Essentially, symbologies is their way of saying encoding. Barcodes are nothing else than just an optical encoding on characters. In a talk yesterday, someone said they're like fonts. This is not correct. Um, the thing is that barcode, the length of the encoded byte changes depending on where in a barcode it is. So here we have some selected symbologies. I'm not going to read all of those to you. The most important, most of you probably know EAN13. That's the stuff on your grocery store shopping list when you go in Germany, or UPC when you go in the United States. Um, I collected some of them. The Interleaf 2 of 5 um, is one of the more um, widely used barcodes. Um, they differ in encoding, they differ in error correction, and what is for us important, because we don't care about error correction, either it beeps or not, um, the character set. And from like the later barcodes um, start to become interesting because they support characters or full ASCII as the code 128 of which we will hear more of later. Then we have weird ass barcodes. I'm sure you've seen the upper one um, printed on envelopes from, uh, of letters that you receive from people you don't like, like Polizei President or insurances or other people. Um, that's the PostNet barcode. The Brits, of course, have their own British post office barcode. Um, but those are also barcodes. They're not decoration. And then we have um, two-dimensional symbologies, and then it becomes really interesting. We have PDF 417, of which we will hear a lot today. 
Um, we have the most widely used because quite powerful data matrix. Um, there, data matrix is nice because you can recognize it um, every time. It has this solid line on the bottom and on the left, and then the dotted line on the right and on the top. And there's the small version that only has one square and the big version that has four squares, and you can easily extend it. Then there is MaxI code, um, which looks like an anthill, and I've only seen it on UPS parcel. And there's at state code, of which Germans have seen a lot. Barcode generation. If we want to play with barcodes, we have to generate some. How do we do that? So there's a lot of software out there to do that. Um, you don't have to do it yourself. Um, highly, I can highly recommend for 1D barcode um, GNU software, which I rarely do. In this case, it's GNU barcode. It actually works perfectly. You just feed it lots of strings that you want to have encoded. It selects the right encoding if you don't tell it which. And it produces PostScript, which you can send to your printer and then do something with the paper. Um, there are online versions. Um, you can just ask them. And there are uncountable commercial versions for generating barcodes. Um, writing your own generator is not really hard. Um, so you can go to the, to the right association and ask them for the standard of the barcode and then write your generator. Um, and most specs are really cheap, about like $20, which next year is going to be like three euros. Um, <laughs> so we got, the, we got them generated, now we have to read them because we want to know what's in the barcodes that we get handed every day. Um, there are two essential ways to do that, hardware scanners or software. Um, Barcode scanners, one-dimensional barcode scanners, are really, really cheap, especially if you go for CCD scanners, which are um, the ones with the LEDs instead of the laser. All scanners um, can be configured to output not just the barcode, but also the type of the barcode. Um, so it will give you all the information you want. Um, you can set the scanner essentially to verbose mode. Um, you should not get a scanner that's better than um, the scanners that you're trying to attack later if you would do so, which you don't. Um, and more on this later. 2D scanners, unfortunately, are still very, very expensive. Now, decoding software, there is some free software. Um, there is some software that can be paid by bytes instead of uh, money. Um, and I've chosen the, the extremely um, capitalist and simple way of just obtained a commercial decoding software. Um, because the reason is, um, I don't know how many of you know Max Moser, but if you ever try to decode a signal f of which you don't know if the decoding is wrong or the stuff you see after the decoding, um, and you know how much that drives you crazy, um, you appreciate the fact that you can actually buy software that does the decoding for you and you only have to worry about the bytes later. So barcodes are essentially used for three different things. Um, either for simple tagging, put some number on some item, um, preferably solid, um, and scan it later. The second is data transport and virtual to physical media. Um, Two-dimensional barcodes in special allow you to send data to someone who's going to transfer it from a virtual medium, like email, onto a physical medium like paper and bring it back to you and it's still machine readable. And other bullshit, or as we call it in German, ganz grober und fug. Um, the first thing that's really interesting about the barcodes is how you configure the scanner. The scanner has two interfaces, one to the backside, to the computer, and one to you, where it scans. Now the interesting thing is it's configured about um, using the front side with special barcodes. Every vendor has a set of configuration barcodes, and there's one that says start configuration, and there's a lot of barcodes that change the configuration, and then there's one that says end and save the configuration. <laughs> so, <laughs> essentially, what you do is first you try to find out what vendor actually made this barcode scanner. There are not so many on the market. Simple logics would be a um, good question, or data logic um, would be the market leaders. Then you get the configuration sheet, either from the vendor's website, which is quite normal, from the dealer's website, or you just call them up. And then you could reconfigure the scanner, um, which means you can change the supported barcode types. You can change if it's emitting character return line feed or not. Um, or change the character encoding. 
especially interesting in places where they um, use characters with little dots on top of it. Um, and they also have key codes like press escape or press page down or press delete. Um, which is interesting because most scanners are actually looped into the keyboard. So um, for the computer, there's no difference if the input comes from the barcode scanner or from the keyboard, which makes the escape key really interesting on MS-DOS type operation. <laughs> um, and then I've actually seen while preparing the slides a scanner that would support software updates via configuration codes. So you could scan in the right configuration code and tell it to please read from the serial line interface that was hanging right next to it. Um, the next operating flash software that it needed, and then it would like flash as firmware and restart. Good. Coming to the barcodes themselves, um, it might be obvious, but I'm actually saying this because it's one of the most efficient things you can do with barcodes. If the barcode is already doing what you want and you just need more of it, go copy them. Don't try to understand what they are doing, don't fuck around, just copy them. Um, this happened at PH Neutral. Some of them might know the conference. Um, so at PH Neutral, there are two different types of batches. One batch is an attendee. The other one is an alcoholic. Um, the alcoholics can actually put money on their badges and pay their beers at the bar with a badge, with a barcode. Um, now, Stefan Zetz, who's also a speaker here, had this brilliant idea of taking a picture with his digital camera of one of those alcoholic badges. Um, and then print it out again and like get beer for free. Which worked and it got scanned and it, he got authenticated. Unhappily, he copied the only one that was already used up. So no free beer for that attack. <laughs> and then we have like entirely obvious situations. This is from a parking garage in Dresden. Um, they don't have any connection between um, the card that you get when you drive in and the card that you put when you drive out. Um, and essentially, they have something called Saisonkarte or long time tickets. Um, and they're valid for like ever. And you just copy them and put them on the internet, and everyone else in Dresden can park for free as well. <laughs> Now, there was an entire talk on the recycling system in Germany yesterday, um, and I looked at it as well, but I didn't care about the bottles and like how they are parsed and blah, 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 because at the end of the day, I get a barcode, and that's worth money. So I looked at the barcode. Um, for everyone who's not German, um, you spend like half a day feeding your empty bottles in this machine, and then it spits out a voucher, um, which you bring to the cashier, and he gives you money for that. Now, of course, there's this goal. Um, the thing is, there was a huge discussion in the audience yesterday if there is a connection between the machine and the cashier system or if it's one-time keys or whatnot. Um, the fact that like punks in Berlin have exploited this for several years proves otherwise. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the obvious attack for the punks was get one ticket for like five euros, go to the copy shop, spend like one euro, get a bunch of tickets for five euros, and go to different Kaisers and get a lot of money. Um, so the reason, this is the reason why actually most shops now have some watermarking on the back side, because if the cashier takes the piece of paper, the barcode has to go down, so they scan it this way, and then they have to see if on the back side there's some fine print that says this is a Kaiser's voucher, whatever. Um, another indicator that there is no connection between the two is the following. There is the EAN13 code that's on those barcodes. Here we have some. Um, starts with a 2. Now, EAN13 um, usually starts with digits that identify the country that makes the stuff that you have the barcode on. Um, Germany usually starts with 4 something. Um, the leading 0 means it's store internal use. Now, store internal use means that your cache system has to be trained of this specific number, um, or parts of it, because if you look closely, you will see that the one says 55 cents ends on something 55, 5, and then the one that says 25 cents ends on 25, 1. Now, if you happen to know that the last digit is actually a check number, uh, which is part of the barcode, then things become really obvious. Can anyone tell me what the maximum number is that you can get from? <laughs> 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 
but I think that would be obvious. Now, my idea is actually because um, because they don't you don't want to see them the piece of paper, make it a sticker and put it under a six pack. The six pack is too heavy to pick up, so it has the barcode on the bottom, <laughs> <laughs> which means you get paid for drinking beer. <laughs> so. There are situations in, in life that make a life of a hacker really, really good. This was one. Um, in the house I live, in, on the floor level, they opened a shop um, that would be DVD rental, fully automatic. So there is nobody. Um, what you get is a member card, a customer card with a barcode, um, and some other stuff. And then you can rent DVDs automatically and play with their system, which is probably not the intention. Um, but there are also a case for access controls. Rarely, but from time to time, you see people using barcodes for access controls. I've not seen a single one that would actually validate the content of the barcode. So it would only go ahead and see, is the barcode matching, like, is the barcode beeping at all? So is the scanner reading anything? Then it will open the door. The more advanced ones will look, is it the right type and has it the right number of digits? But that's about it. So if you see an access system like that, you're in. Yeah. Um, and then, like, all of this is really obvious, but there is a desynchronization that you can do. This is a contractor badge um, that I got. Um, there are two things on your barcode. There is this number, which you can read, and there is this, like, those lines which the scanner can read. And nobody actually proves that they are the same. So actually, people use that against you already. This is, we had a company trip to the zoo, Berlin, it sucked, it was cold, but hey. Um, and if you want to go to the zoo and you're an asshole and you don't want to pay and you're not an ape, um, then, <laughs> then you would buy one ticket and you would try to reproduce them, right? Now, you see those numbers going up here. The, they look quite linear. So you would say, okay, I print a barcode of that number um, or of the next number and print it on. But if you decode the barcodes, you will actually get those numbers over there. So they actually thought of that and like um, try to play tricks with their customers that are not willing to pay, which I can kind of understand. Um, desynchronization can work, work for you um, if it's used in property tracking. Now, you have seen the contra contractor badge two slides before. Um, the procedure here in this company where this is used is if you have your own laptop and you bring it in, then they scan your badge and they scan a barcode that's on your laptop. When you go out, they verify that the barcode under your laptop is still booked on your batch. Now, the thing is, you can easily replace the barcode without replacing the numbers, right? So you find someone whose laptop is really nice. Um, you look at his batch because you can read the number. You generate the barcode, stick it on the batch, take his nice laptop, go to the checkout, um, and put it in your car. Now, the problem is the guy is officially left, and you're out and he's still in. So you have to go back in without a laptop, remove the barcode, go back out because you have to check out yourself and you got one more laptop. Um, that works really well also with MAC addresses. In some cases, people scan, mass scan MAC addresses of machines because someone was playing Optrix and they didn't know why. So if you go like, duh, I forgot to change my MAC address before the attack, you can at least change it on the sticker. Didn't I turn off those animations? Anyway, so back to my beloved video store. The thing about barcodes is barcodes themselves are not evil, but you have to make sure that your procedure is damn right, otherwise you toast yourself. Now here's the procedure with this store. They have the barcoded card, they have a pin, and they have biometric systems, and I told them, fuck off, I only take the pin. Um, the rental procedure goes like this. You swipe your card, you enter the pin, you select the movie, you lock out, and then you get told on which server to pull the DVD. Now, to get the DVD, you go to the server, you swipe the card, you get the DVD, you go watch it. To return it, you swipe the card, you enter the pin, you put the DVD back in the machine, everything is fine. Anyone seen a problem here? No? Now, given I have a barcode, um, of some other customer who just rented a, car, uh, rented a DVD but didn't pick it up yet. Do I need a pin? <laughs> no. <laughs> 
So essentially, since um, the member passes up there, you see there's a member number, and it's four digits, and it's linear. So the guy who signed up after me has 06171, um, which happens to be, I think, let me see, which happens to be the barcode on this. Um, <laughs> so you go to the machine, you swipe it. If he ordered over the internet, you get his DVD. Problem is you can't return it, but honestly, it's not your problem. <laughs> On the other hand, procedure is also important if you attack those systems, because there's also a barcode on the DVD that you rent. And now the obvious idea would be, let's print a barcode onto a like not toasted DVD um, and put that back into the machine. Yeah, that would work, but it would be utterly clear that it was you. So make sure that's correct. Now, next topic with barcodes is injections and multi-decoding. At the beginning, I said um, you can configure barcode scanners. So um, most barcode scanners are left in factory defaults anyway. If they are not, you have config barcodes. Now, the thing is this. The back-end application will, in fact, in a supermarket system, assume that you're scanning EAN 13. So the most skilled programmer will assume that he gets 13 digits out of the barcode reading process. Now, presented with a code 128 barcode of arbitrary length, you can, of course, inject arbitrary characters, which opens the door to SQL injection via barcode, um, separation character injection via barcode, and format string attacks via barcode. The interesting part about that is the old systems that use like MS-DOS backends um, are immune against that because the readers were so crappy they would output bullshit all the time. And so the people wouldn't just like take the blind value and put it into a database. The later systems with the cool barcode readers and the great PHP backend programmers <laughs> are a different story. Now, here's um, a situation where I had the luck of professionally testing a system that was playing with barcodes. And um, we see on the left side um, prepared entry, um, some medical stuff, and on the right side, the decoding. And the third entry here would read long and then have many, many, many characters on it. Um, but there are lots of them missing because one of them was considered the separation character between scanned barcodes in the machine doing the barcode scanning. So it wasn't even in the computer system, but actually in the machine. Um, very interesting bug, but SQL injections work as well. Now, talking about utter bullshit. Um, last week, and that's no joke, um, I had no, not planned this for, for this talk, but last week, we traveled um, by train, and they gave me a newspaper. And I look at the newspaper, and I see a 2D barcode. Um, so the idea of QR codes in newspapers, and apparently that's the new hottest thing, is this. You take with your camera phone a picture of the 2D barcode in a newspaper. You get a commercial software, of course, onto your mobile phone, which will decode this barcode for you and then automatically send your browser to the URL that's encoded in the barcode. An idea is typing URLs is too, yeah, hard. So this is how it looks like. Of course, when they start something like this, they start with like the, uh, the nicest females of 2007. Um, and I don't recognize one. They're all black and white. Um, so of course, I decoded it. The link doesn't even go to the freaking newspaper. It goes to some mobile blocking web 2.0 foobar company um, with a long number next to it, which probably has the biggest mod rewrite file ever in history, um, and sends you the real link. Now, if you increase the numbers, um, you can see who else is using the service. But that's just besides. Now, the thing is, people can print arbitrary content into newspaper. It's called freaking advertising. So most people, especially those with suit and ties, trust their newspaper in the morning, right? So we get cross-site scripting attacks using your damn newspaper. See, if your browser was already authenticated to Gmail, then he just got the cookie. 
Um, and since, yeah, there is this tradition that people can name new attacks, so I call it Koskaitung scripting. <laughs> so, The only thing, the only thing that, like the Russian malware people, Crime 2.0, they have to do is um, revert to Crime 1.0 and rent like a very small piece of newspaper and put a link to an MPEG or IcePEG site on it and own a ton of iPhones. So now we have to tell our managers they're not supposed to click on links in newspapers. Great. <laughs> Okay, um, there is another interesting property about barcodes. Um, with 1D barcodes, you would expect that the length is fixed because most people know EAN 13, and that's always 13. But with other barcode types, and we now know that all the scanners can eat all the barcode types, this is different. It really depends on the resolution you can print the barcode and on the scanner. And since most modern scanners are laser scanners, it depends on the resolution of your printer. Now, if you have a good printer, you can, as you see on the right, you can stuff a lot more characters into the same space. Anyone ever notice that this is a desirable property for hackers? Um, because that brings you to buffer overflows on barcodes. <laughs> So, let's be frank, two things, yes, they happen, no, they're a lot less common than one may think, injection is a lot more common. Your tool of choice, if you want to try this, is a code 128. Um, I already mentioned it supports full 7-bit ASCII, so you get like 128 different characters, including zero, which is important. Um, and they have a special functionality, they have function codes, Several barcodes have function codes. Um, and the function code four um, makes them chainable. So essentially, you can fragment your long exploit into little barcodes and then scan them one after another. <laughs> Don't mix them up. And then at some point in time, you've fed it like 1,024 characters or something. A warning, if you want to try this, it's a pain. If you ever wrote a normal exploit, you know, you fumble around, you send it over, it crashes, you look it up. Uh, you fumble around, you send it over. Here, you fumble around, you print it out, you cut it, you scan it, you wait, you figure out what's wrong, yeah. <laughs> okay, in the QR codes, we couldn't, we couldn't leave the QR codes by themselves, so on the same train trip, um, thanks to UMTS, we got um, the software, one of the softwares, and yeah, of course, they were openly using percent %s all over their formatting, so, um, so much for buffer overflows. But what we also found, and that's just for entertainment, doesn't have anything to do with, buffer over, uh, with barcodes or whatever, we found a UK phone number, we found this brilliant string that this application is only for use within the European Union on a mobile phone. Um, <laughs> We found a hard-coded IP address, and we found like a link to their website with their login and password for asking for more licenses. <laughs> Oops, I forgot something. So, essentially, um, there was the time before certain laws here in Germany, and, and people called like freely try shit. Um, so I did myself. If you want to play with barcodes, then I recommend um, you find something where you freely scan them. Um, you don't ask the cashier to scan like 500 pages of barcodes for you. Um, maybe if you're a very good social engineer. So the first thing that came to mind <laughs> is um, the post station. It's supposed to give you packages that should have arrived at your place anyway, but the damn post people were too lazy to ring, so they put a card in there with a barcode that says go to the damn machine and get the um, package, whatever. Now, what you get then to play with those is a barcode fuzzer. Now, a barcode fuzzer looks more or less like this. Single pages with barcodes. <laughs> and then you go and try them all and see what happens. Unfortunately, here, nothing happened. So the damn thing didn't die or anything. Um, another place that I tried, <laughs> IKEA has this cool entertainment thing. 
uh, and I'm not talking about the big box full of bots. Um, I'm talking about the scanners um, where you can scan your items yourself and see if you already overran your budget. And so I used that one and like scanned all the barcodes. It didn't work. Well done, IKEA. But like obviously the Russians have a different management, so maybe they have a different software. Let's see. Um, next type of attacks, recreation attacks. It's it's really silly to actually like give the attacks names here because it's so obvious. But um, if you can predict what's in a barcode, then you can create barcodes like this, and it's so simple. Um, let's start with some some things. Postal codes. Postal codes are used instead of stamps. So instead of buying stamps, you put postal codes on your um, envelope, and then they get scanned, supposedly, somewhere. And then it's verified, supposedly, somewhere. And then your letter is forwarded. Um, now, what exactly is verified, we don't know, because we're not working at Deutsche Post or anywhere. Now, the Swiss postal code, I get some letters from Swiss in Switzerland, from Sixt. Um, they didn't notice that I'm not working for this company for like two years, but anyway, they had barcodes on them. And yeah, unfortunately, the slides are fucked up with the animation, but anyway. So those are the barcodes, those are the numbers. They don't look too complicated. They, they seem to have structure. And once you find something like this, you can start playing around. Now, I didn't do that with the letters because I wanted, wanted to save a safe um, thing to play with for you. Um, so I don't know what's happening, but it's really cheap to buy some letters and print some barcodes on them and see if they arrive or not. So that's a recommendation for like after Christmas. <laughs> now if you take another letter I got from Switzerland, it had two fucked up one dimensional barcodes and then it, it had a Austrian post barcode. In the Austrian post barcode is a modification of the data matrix. Um, you need a special decoder, and if you decode it, you get a bunch of zeros in ASCII. Now, I wonder how the verification in Austria works. <laughs> and then we get into dangerous, also known as United States territory. The US Postal Service um, has a labeling system that's called Intelligent Mail. If that's not scary enough, I don't know. <laughs> now, it uses a code 128, of which we have heard already a bit. And the specs are on the internet, like the internal specs are on the internet. Um, it tells you exactly on which digits you have to encode what. Now, you can encode the destination zip code, you can tell the label who's paying for this, um, it only works for crates and, and like big sacks. Um, so not for single letters, it only works for a full crate of something, right? Um, and you can say what's in there, like roughly, you have a few digits for that, and a label type, which can only be barcode, and that's about it. One thing we notice, no security feature. <laughs> Second thing we notice, they should not publish this. And then you read in the same specification to maintain the uniqueness, blah, 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 please see a marketing representative. So wait a minute. <laughs> so they have a point where they need uniqueness for 30 to 45 days, but the unique number has to be checked with a marketing guy that tells you it's gonna be unique the next 30 days. Very interesting. Now, on the other hand, we look at, you know, Department of Homeland Security procedures for the Pentagon. They contain a list of things, how to recognize letter bombs. It had everything you can imagine. Incorrect title, excessive postage, um, excessive white, visual destructions, protruding wires and tinfoil. <laughs> but it doesn't say faked barcode on a ship crate full of bombs <laughs> with the sender address of the DOD. So they should add that. Now another thing, I, I'm forced to use air transportation from time to time. And I've noticed the latest trend being um, boarding passes printed out over the internet. I thought, well, I'm not gonna do that because Lufthansa usually doesn't get like people from A to B, so I don't think they get like my boarding pass from A to B. 
And so I didn't use that. Then I noticed, okay, now we have barcodes on the boarding passes that I get when I manually check in with the unfriendly lady. Um, and then I noticed that in Frankfurt, all the security measures actually start to depend on the barcode. There is a central security guy who checks if the barcode goes beep. If it goes beep, you're supposed, you're going to the security, you know the striptease and everything. And then um, if it doesn't, then it doesn't and you're not in security zone. Now this implies that either every airline's online um, check-in system is real-time connected to every airport that uses this security mechanism, hmm. or the security is in a barcode. Now, let's see. <laughs> As I said, I fly a lot. <laughs> um, those are the ones that you get at the counter, right? No. Those are the ones that you get from the internet. And as you see, it does not depend on the airline. There's Air Berlin, there's Swiss, that's from the counter again. Um, now, I wrote myself a little tool, which is called bin ID, um, which shows you byte values in different colors, shades of gray, and then you can document them with more color and like write what's on there. So I documented what's on this thing. So it, Contains everything you need, passenger number, last name, booking code from, to flight number, day of the year, class, important, change M to C and you fly business. Um, <laughs> take... <laughs> um, we have the ticket number and we have the security number and I'm like, whew, they got a security number. Then I start decoding multiple barcodes and the last thing is the security number. <laughs> and I'm like, oops, <laughs> wait a minute. So they didn't even manage to like, get my first name right, um, but the checksum doesn't change. And like, whatever flight I take, whatever booking number I have, the checksum doesn't change. Now for the online booking ones, which are the red ones, um, it doesn't have a booking number and it doesn't have a security code, which means woohoo, we can make boarding tickets. But there's, caution, there is a serious security problem with that because luggage <laughs> depends on your boarding card. Now what happens with the luggage is you get a stripe with one dimensional barcode on your luggage and is logically, it is physically connected to your luggage and logically connected to your boarding pass. Now when boarding online, you can get your boarding pass out of the printer but I tried, it's really hard to get your trolley into the printer. <laughs> so, you have to go to the airport with your boarding pass and drop off your luggage. Assumed it was your boarding pass to begin with. Now, I'm not entirely sure if this scenario works and I hope for our asses it doesn't. Okay, given... <laughs> Now, given this Arabic citizen, um, obviously um, he's a su suspected terrorist, not because he does anything wrong, but he's wearing blankets, which is <laughs> illegal soon. And then there is his counterpart, a high-ranking... a high-ranking government official. Um, <laughs> so this guy actually has his agents. Um, and now what Ernst does is he produces a boarding pass because he knows how the guy in the blankets is called, first name and last name, and he knows the flight, everything else he doesn't need. Then he goes to luggage drop-off <laughs> and drops off some luggage some more, including a little gift. <laughs> and then the luggage goes to x-ray. Um, <laughs> to the typical, you know, security that we have. And they found a new terrorist and can pass new laws. Great. Now the problem is, the guy's innocent and we don't want the laws. 
So, fixed rank commendation, just outlaw luggage. <laughs> See, it worked brilliantly with water. You can't bring evil bottles of water into the plane anymore. Um, but they're totally legal if you bought them for three or four euros after the security. Now, like Frankfurt Airport has all those affordable, um, like, dress-up places, like Escada and, you know, Mont Blanc and, and who else. So just outlaw luggage because, well, the, the businessmen can afford it. They can, you know, go through the security and buy everything new after security. Should work well. Now, we have some unsolved cases. Um, unsolved case one is Deutsche Post Frankfurt. And unsolved case two is Deutsche Bahn. I have to say, um, being German lately really sucks, but when I looked at those two barcodes, I was impressed that at least the German companies figured out that they should ask someone who knows and at least try to put some crypto in there. I don't know if the crypto is solid, but I couldn't decode them, obviously. So I have to say, heads up, perfect. Now what I'm really interested in, What I'm really interested in is this. You get this, like Department of Homeland Security says it all. The interesting thing is you get this barcode when you leave the United States. <laughs> um, and it comes out of a machine that again, wants your fingerprint and your eye scan and your firstborn and you know, everything. Um, it comes out and they, nobody ever wants to see it. Nobody scans it, nobody looks at it, nobody asks you for it. They just pile up at home if you have to fly to the US from time to time. So, I have no idea what's really in there. Here you see the tool in action again. Um, this is why I wrote it, because if someone is really random, you see it on the bitmap. It is really black and really white. And on the, like, the topmost line is text, is ASCII, and it's gray, because ASCII only differs in very few bits from each other, the characters differ. So you can see by looking at large number, um, large heap of data, you can see in the pixels if there's some ASCII in there or um, some other structure. So this is how they look, there are two barcodes. And here's my invitation. So I have this damn expensive decoding software. And I have this tool that I use. And um, if any one of you wants to play around with barcodes, you can, sh can just send me whatever you have, like scanned images or whatever, I'm going to decode them for you and send them back. If there are more than five people, I'm going to automate the process, but anyway. Um, that works because we can link to the library, luckily. And if anyone wants to um, look at unknown heaps of unknown data and wants this tool to play around with, um, let me know and you get it and you're supposed to provide feedback, otherwise I'm going to beat you up next Congress. So this actually brings us um, to almost the final slide. Principles of secure barcode use. If you have to implement a, a, a barcode system, understand it's like a browser cookie. People eat cookies, people intercept cookies, people copy cookies, people modify cookies, people do everything they are not supposed to do with cookies. They, do. they can do the same thing with barcodes. If you can only use one-dimensional barcode, Make sure it's just a freaking number in your system that nobody else can make any use of. Don't generate it off the username and like the as with and whatnot. Um, but generate a random number, put it into your system and match it up. If you use 2D barcodes, use real crypto. You got the space, it's not gonna cost you more, maybe like a few millimeters around the barcode. They can be extended, they don't have a real size limitation, only on scanning. Um, and on top of it all, make sure your damn process works. If your process works like the one in like my video rental store, go back, design it again. Um, make sure nobody can like fuck around with it and never ever trust the printed number under the barcode. And that was it for barcodes.